empowers agripreneurs to reach their full potential. We have the co-founder and CEO Chris with us today. Thanks for joining in, Chris. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Chris, I was I was re- reading about you before uh, this conversation, and uh, came across the word lingo, which in Swahili means you know goal, and I think that speaks a lot about what you are building at uh, at E Lingo. So, could you just walk us through uh, what what you're building here exactly? For sure. Um, so yeah, like you said, Lango means means um, goal, target, aim, um, and, and that's all we want to do. We want to, you know, this, the students and community we work with, we we want to give them, you know, kind of the tools and resources so they can, you know, aim and reach that full potential and reach their goals. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, I guess before diving into what we do now, I'll, I'll bring it back a few years to. Um, to where my story started uh, in the social enterprise space. And um, we can dive deeper if, uh, if we would like. Um, but I, I traveled to, um, after I graduated, didn't really go down any formal employment path against my parents' wishes, mm-hmm. um, but ended up going to, to Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, and there I was, I was lecturing uh, students, kind of local case studies uh, in, in the environment and uh, did some research on micro enterprise uh, on the ground. Okay. So um, that was kind of the, my first um, experience being on the ground in East Africa and working in, in somewhat development work. And I absolutely loved it. Um, through that journey, uh, saw it would led to my first social enterprise, uh, saw a lot of, of libraries that I was teaching at working with students were essentially bare, uh, filled with mm-hmm. kind of tattered material and I saw a lot of the material that was being taught or used was similar to the ones we had back home in North America. Okay. So when I returned back home, uh, that image and those experiences were at the back of my mind. Uh, and, and then I started my first social enterprise uh, and, and B corporation called uh, Textbooks for Change. Okay. So what that company did uh, was collect university and college textbooks from across Canada uh, we would donate 50% to the universities and libraries that we would work with in East Africa. And then, of course, made sure the content was applicable to what was being, being taught. Um, a portion would be recycled efficiently if the books were old and tattered. And, and really how the whole engine worked uh, is we would resell 20% uh, of the books online um, to students across North America. And that would give the fuel uh, to keep the company growing and expanding and, and making an impact. So we, we did that for, you know, was doing that for about six years and we donated about 400,000 books. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a, great, uh, a great experience through that journey. Um, but from there, it uh, was really itching, and I'll get into Lango now, but was really itching um, to, to see what's next. And throughout that journey and through my journey in school, I really discovered kind of my passion lied in, in education and entrepreneurship uh, and, and really kind of how technolo- technology intertwined the two. Um, mm-hmm. And, and we, I wasn't quite doing that at Textbooks for Change fully, um, but I wanted to you know, explore opportunities um, where I could run and, and figure something out that's going to make an impact. Mm-hmm. So um, at that time, started doing a lot of research on the ground um, throughout East Africa, in Rwanda, Uganda, and Kenya. Um, and started to understand the environment a little bit more and and where these big institutions saw the future of of education. Uh, And uh, what I saw was just a really big disconnect. And and to be honest, it's it's similar, you know, through my studies in North America. Um, It's, you know, what was being taught in the school wasn't really applicable when you get out. Um, You know, you know, if you look at agriculture, which we got into, they're teaching, you know, supply and demand looking, you know, thousands of feet above of how it all works. When yeah. unemployment rates are so high, you know, you need yeah. to start to teach micro entrepreneurship, you know, how to right. start a chicken farm, utilize the quarter acre you have. Um, so those experiences kind of, you know, brought me into, you know, there's a massive opportunity here. Um, and, uh, yeah, from, from then on, we started to, um, we did a lot of research. We got data points from about 8,000 farmers online, 
uh, okay. figured out that it's very complicated. Uh, you need to start somewhere. Uh, so we, we created a community of farmers um, where they could share information, ask experts advice. Uh, we had a marketplace where, where they could uh, buy and sell from each other. Um, and when we started to bring that together, there was a lot more demand for structure. You know, great to have a few PDFs and videos on chicken farming, but I want a full package that's going to teach me how to, you know, start from the beginning with five or 10 chickens and grow to 100, grow to 200, 300, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I started my own chicken farm, uh, which didn't go too well. You know, if you're going to teach it, you got to you got to do it. Um, and we found one of the best chicken farmers uh, throughout the journey to record a course with. Um, so okay. I went with my phone to their farm, recorded the course, uh, and uh, started to uh, offer that course online to some of our students. Uh, and they started to really enjoy that, right? We, we started to get our first paying customers, a dozen turned to two dozen, turned to 100 customers. Um, and then there's more and more demand for, for more courses like that. Uh, so we developed a beekeeping course. Um, and at that time, I was the, the person filming most of it. Uh, beekeeping right. one was a story for another day. Um, but, uh, um, but yeah, over the last uh, year and a half, we've been really um, doubling down on, on creating, you know, this content catered towards micro entrepreneurs in the agriculture sector. So, you know, mm -hmm. we want to teach people to start a chicken farm, to utilize their quarter acre, to, you know, create a business around beekeeping and create hives. So, um, mm -hmm. This year, we, we we're gonna you know by the end of the year have about thirty different online courses. Um, mm -hmm. A course that's gonna you know you know lead into many other uh, opportunities down the road. But uh, mm -hmm. you know that's what we, we do now. We we offer um, you know long story short, we offer uh, uh, online education and, and extension services um, for 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 entrepreneurs in the agriculture sector. And uh, okay. you know the main aim of that is for them to reach their full potential. Right, right, right. No, thanks for telling the backstory. I mean, this all, you know, fits in so well. And now I understand clearly why, why you had built Lengo and how, how you're running things there. Uh, what really impressed me is like, you know, those micro entrepreneurs in the agriculture sector that you spoke about. I mean, for me, if I think about it, like the easier way could have been working with those micro entrepreneurs in the agriculture sector in North America or say South America. But, but you went to like Africa and, you know, regions in Eastern Africa. What, what was the reason behind uh, doing that, like going that extra mile and, and helping farmers there? Um, so a few different reasons. Uh, one would, of course, through uh, my journey with the previous company, I spent a lot of time in East Africa doing research before that. Uh, so I started to develop a network and started to feel comfortable with, with going around visiting people doing interviews, things like that. So that's definitely a piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you look at, you know, look at the problem, there's, um, you know, the fastest growing population in, in any continent, if you look to, to 2020 to 2050, um, extremely high unemployment rates, uh, especially right. amongst the youth. Um, mm -hmm. But then on the opportunity side, um, mm -hmm. You know, currently, if you look at, you know, many countries within Sub-Saharan Africa, um, they're, they're net importers at this point. Um, and if you look at it, it's like the most fertile land almost in the whole world, and yet you're right. still importing food and there isn't food security. Um, so, you know, from those problems, it leads to a lot of opportunity, right? It's, I mean, you, you teach people to utilize those, that land in a proper way. Obviously, yeah. it takes time, but you can mm -hmm. transition to be a net exporter, right? And, and mm -hmm. to do that, you can create employment, encourage youth um, to get into that. And once you mm -hmm. start to couple that opportunity with, mm -hmm. you know, the ex you know, explosive growth of technology, you know, mm -hmm. really things are going to start to come together and, you know, looking five to ten years out. Um, okay. You know, sure, right now, many rural communities may not have you know, access to the internet, it's starting to grow. But if you look 10 years out, you know, smartphones are going to be half the price, a quarter of the price, you know, internet access is going to be much grander and, and about, mm -hmm. you know, I'd say a quarter to half the price it is now. Um, right. So if you look at that, you know, the need and then the population growth and the technology growth, 
um, that problem can can really you know turn to you know a huge opportunity. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it j- just you know those are the reasons why we're working in that space. But that's applicable to, to many other developing nations as well, right? And right. Latin America and India and Southeast Asia. So, um, you know, we started in Sub-Saharan Africa because there's, there's definitely a, a need there and, and a huge opportunity. But, you know, the beautiful thing about technology is, is you know, you can, you can really grow it to, to, uh, to new regions that are at a rapid rate once you, once you really figure out the fundamentals. We're not there yet, right. but, but we'll get there. Right, right. Some of the points that you mentioned there, especially the facts and, and your vision as an entrepreneur that I would like to highlight, like I had no idea about the, about Africa being, uh, you know, a net importer of uh, agricultural products. So that's a startling fact, fact for me. And I think it would be for, for most of our viewers. So thanks for sharing that. I think that tells us the real problem there. Also, I, I really like, you know, you, the balance, I think that you have uh, maintained as an entrepreneur between executing things and, and the vision. So you can see that in 10 years, it, internet would become cheaper and these resources would be more accessible, but at the same time, you are executing things at, at the ground level now. So, I mean, that's, that's a really great point for someone who wants to start uh, their entrepreneurial journey of, you know, balancing between this long-term vision and executing in today so so thanks thanks for sharing that it's it's uh it's not easy and i I paddle with it every day right you can get so caught up in the thick of it of of, Hmm. you know day-to-day selling a course getting sales whatever it may be um it's really important to kind of take a step back and look at a high level And, and to be honest you know a lot of that is is taking time off you know taking a vacation going for a walk Things right. outside of the day to day, that's when you start to really get that high level. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, like mental health for entrepreneurs is a thing that is discussed now these days, maybe, but it wasn't, you know, if you look like two to three years back. Yeah. Yeah. And when I went to school, right, they, they almost yeah. teach the opposite of that. But yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, Chris, you, you mentioned uh, briefly, you know, you had a social and social business before. This is your second venture. What what keeps you, you know motivated to work on these social enterprises on, on a on a daily basis? Um, you know, and it took a while to get there, but you know now we're hearing you know farmer stories of mm-hmm. you know they didn't know there was an opportunity. They were you know they were looking for that extra bit of income to to send their mm-hmm. kid to school, whatever it may be. Uh, we're starting to hear those stories now. And of course, collecting impact data, we're starting to see, you know, in the early stages of it, but positive results. And yeah. So that coupled with the testimonials every day, like if you look at a lingo, that really yeah. fires me up and, and keeps me excited. Um, yeah. But looking back, um, I've always kind of had a passion to give back uh, in some way or form, um, right. whether you're like volunteering, mentoring students at the school, uh, I never really connected that with, you know, running a social enterprise in my own business one day. Uh, for some reason, I didn't connect that uh, until later on in life. Um, so I, I thought, you know, originally I'm going to I'm gonna get into business. Uh, and, and we discussed a little bit earlier, um, you know, I had a similar, you know, experience going through school is, you know, I, I always wanted to give back and had a passion to make a change. But then... I, I went to school and felt like I was just put into a mold um, of of working as hard as I can to make the most money for shareholders, um, whether that be in, in eye banking or consulting or accounting, whatever it may be. I just, you know, it kind of made me think of what I want in life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it came to the point of, you know, I definitely don't want to be in that mold. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm passionate about entrepreneurship and sustainability. So at that point, once I was, tra- you know, thrown into that mold, I knew it wasn't me. I was extremely miserable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, started to find my way. I, I went into sustainability and entrepreneurship. 
um, certificates started to being you know connected with a network that was you know like-minded. I uh, went on you know a few excursions to Honduras and like I said to East Africa um, to to get me you know on the ground and hands-on with the development work, not you know doing research from a very high level, but actually getting your hands dirty, and I loved it. Um, so those are things you know along that journey of um, yeah to. to that really got me fired up to what I'm doing now. Um, but like I, I kind of said earlier, through that journey, I developed the passion of like, you know, I love education if you do it in the right way. I love entrepreneurship. You know, how can we then connect these things um, to do something I love? And, and of course, the journey is long and winding, right? It, it took a while yeah. to get there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that, that's kind of the, the first few steps. So, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, you know, yeah. School put me into a mold that was not me. I broke free yeah. of it. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Thank, thanks a lot for sharing uh, all that, uh, Chris. And switching gears a bit here uh, and moving to, you know, obviously this, you have uh, told us that this journey and no entrepreneurial journey is, is uh, goes without any challenges. So, and this one hasn't uh, either. So what, what have some of your biggest challenges been here uh, you know with with your two social enterprises so far <laughs> where do i begin i can write a book on this so far and i've only been a few yeah. years um yeah. but uh you know a lot of different things um one is, is kind of you know the team is everything right you, you got to bring people and you got to care for them you got to keep right. them motivated and give that vision um but it's hard when you're you're so tied up in day-to-day -day work that sometimes you lose sight of that. Um, right. So, you know, the team is everything is an important thing. Um, you know, get that balance as well. Like, you know, I know in school that you know, work in 80, 90 hours a week. It's like, you know, no, you'll burn yourself out. You know, that's not a long-term type of thing. Um, so that's a big thing. It's just like trying to find, you know, a balance that is sustainable for me has been right. you know, a huge lesson throughout the years. Mm -hmm. And I'm still not there yet, right? But, you know, it's, it's a journey. Um, but that's, you know, another big thing. Uh, so the team and the balance are big ones on the side. Um, and then if you look, you know, kind of in the technical things, um, day to day in the Lengo, like if you look at um, North America, you know, if you want to set up a paywall, you got PayPal, which is going to, you know, conquer the market in, in North America and Europe. And then you look, you know, in where we try to grow Lango and sell our courses, that's been our biggest headache from day one. Um, you, know, you know, Africa, you know, many people group it in as, as, as a country, but no, okay. there's, you know, dozens of different countries. Every country has their own banking system, telecoms, uh -huh. um, you know, yeah, mobile payments, USSD, you name it. So it, it's, um, that's been the biggest thing of just getting the, the cocktail of different payment providers there um, and, and catering towards each region. Um, and that coupled with, you know, being mobile first, you know, a lot of companies again in North America and Europe are, are building to um, for people who have laptops or streaming on uh, on a TV or, or really high bandwidth environments. Uh, so we needed to keep, you know, a mobile first approach and, and try to get as low bandwidth as possible. So, you know, we took a learning management system, we gutted it, you know, 95% of the things to be, you know, the necessities, right? Um, and then having, you know, with our videos, you know, having bandwidth adjustments so they can lower the quality, um, mixing in SMS and WhatsApp and email messages to coach people along. Um, and, and digital literacy is growing, right? A lot of these, a lot of people we work with, they, they, you know, either just got a smartphone or got one within the last one or two years. So it's kind of mm -hmm. teaching them how to use our platform. So that's been a big challenge throughout the year. It's mm -hmm. definitely making a lot of progress. Um, but it's, you know, things you may not think of running a company uh, in yeah. Canada, what I did before, to, to being on the ground uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, those are, uh, those are some of the things. But, uh, you know, all in all, bring it back to more lessons. It's, it's one step at a time. Um, yeah. you, you, you know, su growing a company does not happen overnight. You know, you hear these big success stories, but it's, 
you know, painful hours and tweaks and testing and customer interviews um, that go along the way. So, uh, you know, anyone who wants to jump in and uh, grow something quick, it's never going to happen. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah. yeah, just one step at a time, pace yourself, have that balance the way through. Yeah, yep. I mean, it never happens overnight, although most people think that it does, but it, it never does. And like, yeah, great points. Uh, I mean, most of the things that we take for granted here are, are not, you know, the normal, so-called normal things uh, in, in Africa because things are still developing and uh, improving. So thanks, thanks for sharing all those details. And uh, lastly, Chris, I, I want to understand what lies ahead for for Elengo. Like, w- what are the plans, you know, in terms of, in terms of the products, in terms of the new markets that you are trying to explore in, in the coming uh, two to three years? Lots of stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I always try to keep an eye on what we need to do in three months and, and what it could look like five years from now, because the middle just blends together and keeps adjusting. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. You know, in the foreseeable future, um, more content, you know, we're, we have mm-hmm. two film teams going around filming new courses for us. So, um, and taking one step further in the agriculture sector. So sure, we started, you know, on the farm on how to grow chilies or, or uh, you know, having beehives, but it's, it's the next step. It's like how to now dry those chilies and make a pepper or a sauce or, you know, take milk and make ice cream or cheese. So we're, it's taking one more step down the value chain. So people who may not necessarily consider the, themselves farmers um, okay. but still can be micro entrepreneurs in that space. Okay. Um, so that's, you know, definitely something we'll be doing next year. Um, we're launching a, a marketplace. So a lot of students, you know, come through our courses, let's say they're a beekeeper, they need hives, they need a smoker, they need a bee suit. So we want to find the right partners for them to buy that and, and connect them to. So that's one, definitely uh, one thing to do. And then, you know, expanding to new countries, new regions, um, obviously that, you know, voiceovers in different languages we need to look through, you know, again, every country is different. Um, so that's, um, you know, definitely what we need to do. Uh, and eventually, you know, when you look many years out, um, you know, we'll have hundreds, thousands of farmers doing specific things in different regions, right? So there's a lot of things that we've been thinking through of how to connect these farmers to work together um, and start to make these regions and net exporters, right? So we need to start somewhere. You can't just jump into that. Um, but we, we have a lot of big ideas uh, around how to connect that um, and, and grow it long term. So, um, and the, like, to be honest, the education space, I see it, it's going to be a leapfrog of what we see in, in North America, right? It's, right. I don't necessarily seeing university or college being that one-stop shop i see a lot of education turning digital um Mm -hmm. turning to to create and foster micro entrepreneurship uh so you know i hope we're playing in the right space but uh you know i see i see them leapfrogging and uh um and a lot of a lot of things that we not necessarily we've done wrong but uh you know it's, it's gonna be different i'm excited to see okay yeah, right. Like uh, education, in fact, is moving out of you know those walls of universities and uh, to to the digital space. And the way you are leveraging it and you know trying to build a community out of that is is, is spectacular to watch. So kudos to you on you know taking up this initiative not once but twice and you know helping uh, communities that that need it and growing at at a steady pace and you know. Uh, helping more people out there so thanks a lot first of all for for doing that chris and uh, and thanks for joining us today and sharing uh, all those insights no problem thanks for having me again it's uh one step at a time we're one step at 10 if not 100 in this journey so uh but you know excited excited about the work we do